Thank you all for the invitation. Thanks uh, to Ray uh, and Maureen uh, for the wonderful uh, talks. Obviously, I'm still thinking about them. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, what I did not realize was going to be so closely tied to both of the talks we just heard. Uh, a particular kind of privileged ally, uh, which is the mentor. Um, I think everybody here knows, uh, as well as anyone, that mentors are essential uh, for the ability to uh, people who are and populations that are not typically part of um, highly powerful uh, uh, positions in not just the corporate world, but in policy, in academia, etc. We all know that mentors are essential. Uh, and uh, we all know that most of us got to where we are through some form of mentorship, uh, sometimes quiet mentorship behind the scenes as I've learned increasingly as I've moved up myself. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, the difficulties that can come from this particular kind of ally to be an effective mentor even under the best of circumstances. And you'll have to forgive me um, not only am I in, ex in an extremely meditative state after that talk, but, uh, uh, but to top it off, I have a, a baby uh, who's very lovely. It's my first, and uh, she, lovely, 12 months. And yesterday she had a uh, round of uh, vaccines, the kind that really hurt. And so nobody slept last night. <laughs> so I was going to take you a minute to wake up. Okay, mentoring. Um, mentoring is useful for a number of reasons. As everybody here knows, but it's worth remembering, uh, a good mentor provides access uh, through at least three different ways. Uh, one is information. Uh, a good mentor tells you which jobs to take and not take, uh, helps you avoid pitfalls and so on, uh, helps you figure out uh, pathways to success for you that you may not have realized, help you invest your time and energy in the right kinds of things. A second thing a mentor provides is connections. Uh, if a mentor is effective enough and powerful enough, a mentor can literally connect you to people and uh, organizations that are important for you to move, to know as you move up, regardless of your industry, whether it's in policy, in government, in nonprofits, in corporate America, et cetera. And the third thing a mentor provides, which I think should not be forgotten in this particular context, is support. Uh, a good mentor, uh, and again, I'm talking about at the extremes, is a kind of confidant, not necessarily emotionally, but frankly, often emotionally, uh, a person who can say, you know what, uh, what you're experiencing is actually not that rare, or here's how to deal with it, or let me just listen to you, vent, because as we all know, moving up is hard and stressful. We also know that mentoring often fails, and um, it often fails, uh, for also well-known reasons, uh, a lack of commitment, literally, even in the best of cases, and I'm talking both about those formal mentoring programs that we've all heard about, I'm part of a couple of them myself, where you're encouraged to mentor people because we know it's good for young people, et cetera. Um, uh, sometimes it's a lack of commitment, literally, you don't provide the information that you could or the, right, the guidance at the times that you could have, you're just not aware. Uh, sometimes it's just lack of power. You yourself, even though you're a saint, you are not connected enough uh, to really help anybody uh, to open the kinds of doors required to move up in certain kinds of contexts. And the third is just a lack of the kind of the basic kind of trustworthiness or skill required to be a good listener, to really be able to help people navigate difficult circumstances. And in fact, we just heard, uh, I think really provocatively, a context in which um, speaking up uh, can be quite difficult uh, without the right kind of guidance. So, uh, uh, so good mentors are, are committed, uh, they're powerful to some extent, uh, and they're skilled in the sense that they can capture, they understand the person as a person and can be essentially a good confidant. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the circumstances in which even outstanding mentors, or all of these things, can nonetheless fail for reasons that have less to do with them as individuals than with the mentor relation and the institutions in which the mentor relation uh, is embedded. In other words, uh, uh, a mentor is a more powerful person who's helping a less powerful person move up 
in an institutional context where the possibility of ambiguity of multiple kinds can actually undermine the relation, even in the best of cases. Um, and, and I'm gonna give you a case to, to make this concrete, uh, in part because we're at the Harvard Business School and cases are the way everybody does everything here. Um, that was a positive comment, uh, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, uh, but uh, before that, I'd like, to, I'd like to discuss one particular kind of ambiguity that I think is particularly important. And again, thinking about the fact that a mental relation is a relation uh, that is happening in a particular context. And I'd like to talk about, and just briefly, uh, introduce the idea of reciprocity. Uh, we think of mentors as confidants uh, in some senses, so let's think about the idea of reciprocity in the particular sense in which a confidant might be a reciprocal relation. So most relations uh, have, a, have a kind of reciprocity. So for example, uh, my wife and I have a reciprocal relation in the sense that if I need to vent something, an event about something on a particular day, I can expect that at some time down the line, she's going to be able to, she's going to feel the need and I have the obligation to listen to her vent. In other words, we have an emotional reciprocity that is relevant. That kind of reciprocity is useful. Uh, there are other kinds of relations that also have a kind of reciprocity, but the reciprocity is not emotional. If I vent to my therapist, uh, I don't really expect my therapist to then vent back to me at a future time. In fact, that would be very weird and exactly the opposite of what uh, I expect the therapist. But what the therapist expects is a check. And that is, in a sense, the kind of reciprocity. And, you know, you can say, well, there are other kinds of therapists, like priests and rabbis. Well, they also expect checks in different ways uh, or commitments of other sorts, right? Uh, but the idea is, you know, in any kind of relation, either the relationship is emotionally reciprocal or not, there's something you give as a result of having received. What I'd like to propose is that in many mental relations, there is what we can think of as a reciprocal ambiguity, a kind of ambiguity about the right form of reciprocating and whether it has happened that can undermine even the best of mentors and the relations of even the best of circumstances. And the way to think about it broadly is this. If uh, I am an extraordinary mentor to somebody and I've helped and provide information and provide connections and listen to this young person. That person feels indebted as in any relation. How does that person know that they've reciprocated? I'm certainly not going to ask that person to listen to my problems, to provide access to information they don't have or to provide access to connections they don't have. What is the nature of the reciprocity? What I'm gonna argue and show you in a case is that the ambiguity that can arise as a result of that dynamic can actually undermine the mental relation in ways that matter for how we think about how an ally, privileged ally, can help or not help. And as you'll see, that can even have consequences uh, such that, and I now have a language to describe this, uh, those difficulties can actually be embodied uh, in the relation itself, which is part of why I'm so surprised and part of why I'm so reflective. So I'd like to discuss a case. And the case I'm, uh, I'm gonna describe is the academic context. Uh, and it's, an, and, it's, an, and it's, a, it's a mental relation in an academic context for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, obviously the academic context is a first real step in many fields. Big STEM as an obvious case. Uh, but uh, with respect to mentoring both masters and PhD programs uh, across the board, just closer to the workplace than they are to schooling. Um, uh, the second reason I'm gonna talk about the academic context is that I happen to be leading, at the moment, as in today, uh, and for the next uh, many months, a task force of more than 40 people here at Harvard that's trying to address uh, student mental health, improve mental health among students, both undergraduate but also graduate and professional students, uh, because it turns out that mental health problems have risen not just as a secular issue, but even in the last three years uh, across the board. And we're trying to figure out a way of addressing this. And the third reason I wanna talk about an academic context is um, because I just wrote a book <laughs> in which I talk about these issues in an academic context. And so I have a case to give you. 
Uh, so I'd like, if you, if you would indulge me, I'm going to read uh, for you a short passage from the book uh, to introduce a case that may help inform the discussion that we're going to have in a minute. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to discuss a graduate student whom I call in the book Queenie and her advisor, Hans, whom Queenie feels very close to uh, because he's an extremely effective mentor. Queenie has known Hans for many years, in fact, and for the particular issues that worried Queenie, Hans had repeatedly find him, found himself to be an especially informative and useful mentor. Queenie was a social science student who was smart, thoughtful, driven, and deeply conflicted on whether she should have enrolled in her PhD program at all. She had been a, an undergraduate at the same university, Hillmount, and in her senior year, and without knowing exactly what she wanted, she applied to four graduate programs when she was an undergrad. Not surprisingly, given that she didn't know what she wanted, she was accepted at none of them. Despondent, she left town, moved in with her boyfriend, and took a regular job. Nonetheless, she kept in touch with several faculty, including her BA thesis advisor, who was Hans. Two years later, uh, now more intellectually and personally mature Queenie, applied to programs again. This time, she was accepted at two programs. One was Hillmount's, and the other one was a dream program that was an exceptionally good intellectual fit. The pro program also offered her a much larger grant than Hillmount did, and it was a top five program in the country. In addition, contrary to Hillmount, it was located in the city where Queenie and her fiance now lived. The choice seemed completely obvious. But Queenie was conflicted. With little real evidence, Queenie had concluded that her success in the second round of applications was due not to her greater maturity, but to her advisor's letters of recommendation to the access that the powerful mentor had provided. I'm quoting now, um, as you can tell. Um, they kind of pushed for me hard, unquote. She felt a deep sense of obligation. Had her advisors, I asked, tried to force her to attend Hillmount? Quote, I mean, they told me it was better for me to come here, but Hans never said, like, you have to come to Hillmount or anything like that. But I just felt indebted and very loyal and very appreciative, unquote. That sense of loyalty and obligation may seem strange. The fact that her advisor wrote a strong letter of recommendation is not actually special. In fact, it's part of his job. And even if Hans had somehow written nicer things that were warranted given her record, which I frankly doubt, Recommendation letters today, as we all know, are an exercise in hyperbole and exaggeration. They are the narrative version of great inflation. I, I sometimes say that some professors seem to have the best student they've taught in decades, year after year. <laughs> they must be living in like multiple dimensions, you know, each with its allocation of once in a lifetime geniuses. Anyway, in fact, the advisor's professional role requires providing students with many kinds of support, including scholarly, professional, and personal advice. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Advisors are confident. What Hans did was part for the course. However, the relation between an advisor and a student is distinct in two ways. First, although advisors, as mentors, are required to support students, they often, as in Hans' case, have a choice of which students to support. Time is a zero-sum resource, and advisors can only invest in one student at the expense of time spent in another. No mentor can mentor everybody. Mentors have to choose. Thus, this form of support is an investment which students are expected to reciprocate, even if this expectation is not stated explicitly. Second, although the student is expected to reciprocate, the proper form of reciprocity is not always clear. An advisor-student relation is a lot like the relation between a therapist and a patient in that emotional support typically travels only in one direction, at least in the healthy ones. Um, advisors, like therapists, do not vent their problems to their students. Again, at least the good ones. But a patient knows that in return for the therapist's support, she must write a check. When a student has received support from an advisor, what exactly must she do to reciprocate? Do well in her classes? Work hard? Try to compete her assignments on time? While surely all of these are probably some part of it, how will a student know that the debt, the emotional debt, has been repaid? That this favor that this wonderful mentor did for you, you've now finally paid off? The answer is simply unknown. And this ambiguity, in fact, 
is an important source of control on the part of the advisor. It is a form of power, as Nietzsche would call it, even if a benign advisor decides not to exercise it. One of the deepest forms of obligation is to know that one is indebted while being unsure exactly how the debt must be repaid. So that was Queenie's predicament. And its effect was twofold. First, that enrollment, the rational decision from her perspective of her professional success, her personal finances, her future family, was to decline Hillmount and enroll in the other university in the same town she already lived that gave her more money and it was a more prestigious program. It's completely obvious. But quote, primarily because I felt an intense loyalty to, beholden to the professors at Hillmount, even though they didn't say that, unquote, she enrolled. This was her first year. I should say. Queenie was not particularly paranoid in being unsure whether, quote, it would have been okay, unquote, if she had attended another school. In the economy of emotional and professional debt she had incurred, even benign statements by her advisors, for example, that it was, quote, it was better for me to come here, unquote, could reasonably be interpreted as a creditor calling for payment on an emotional debt. So she went to Hillmount. Now, six months into her program, she was miserable. Quote, and it's, very strange, it's a very strange feeling because I usually don't regret things, unquote. While many students worry about their fit with their programs, for those of you who are first year graduate students, it's very common. Uh, Queenie's consternation was far more existential, primordial, and sustained. It was a sense of betrayal with herself of which she was reminded every time she sat in a seminar that failed to stimulate her thinking and every day she awoke on a bed far from her future fiance. Quote, I wake up in the morning crying about it, unquote. I asked her to explain, quote, it is a huge regret of mine and I have to move past it, but it just feels like I gave up something that I really wanted for the sake of somebody else, for some, you know, other people as opposed to myself. And that's what really bothers me, unquote. The anguish was relentless, quote, I mean, I'm constantly thinking about it. There are a few moments where I don't feel it, even in the background, a pain, a regret. It's probably the most consistent thought I have. Earlier in the interview, Queenie had reported three people in her life as confidants. We were asking people who they confided in when they had difficult issues. Um, her boyfriend, her long-time uh, long friend Marla, and her advisor. I asked her if she ever talked about this issue. Right? This is, if you're thinking constantly about it, it must be eating you inside. Who do you talk about it? She certainly had talked to her boyfriend, which wasn't surprising. She had talked to Marla, but she also had Hans. And if you think about it, Hans was better suited than any other people, any of those other people to understand her predicament and to help her think through this. Hans, if anybody would have said, no, Queenie, it's totally fine. You could have gone anywhere you wanted. But Queenie never approached Hans with this issue. Quote, I don't know my options, she explained. Hans would know them. They were all so close. And she knew she could trust him. And he was probably aware, quote, I mean, I think he knows. He knows I'm constantly traveling out of town to see my boyfriend and that this takes a toll on me. But there's a second way the ambiguity of the predicament affected her. Though Hans was perfect to talk to, she explicitly avoided him. And we're almost done. Quote, I don't really feel comfortable at this stage talking to him about wanting to leave. In fact, unquote, in fact, she never broached the topic. A year later, she finally had realized that she, it probably would have been okay to, go, to have gone to the other program. But she was still unclear whether talking about it now, a year and a half later, would violate expectations about the full, proper form of reciprocity. Close relations, I argue, are not imbued from ambiguity and neither are, even in the best of intentions, close advisor relations, close mentor relations. For Queenie, the ambiguity paved the way for a kind of power, one in which the student ultimately regulated herself. They were close, but perhaps too close. To wrap up, I'd like to propose uh, three things for us to think about. One is that power in these kinds of relations is inevitable. A privileged ally, to use the language in a sense, and a mentor in this particular sense, is more powerful. It's unavoidable. And so the question is, how do we manage that particular situation in a world in which we think and believe that mentors are going to be important. This is especially the case uh, given that today, uh, mentors for women, for people of color, are very often not going to be other women or other people of color. 
we simply don't have the numbers. It's just not gonna be the case. It will not be the case that the majority of students of color who come through this program are going to have a faculty of color or only faculty of color as mentors because there's just not the numbers yet. So there's something that we had to take into account. Second, ambiguity may not be, uh, but it often is. Uh, ambiguity both about how to repay the debts and second about knowing when you're done. When do you no longer have to repay the debts to your advisor, to your mentor, to the person to open doors for you? It's unclear. I like to think about what are ways in which increasing transparency might actually help lower ambiguity for those in the less powerful position. And lastly, I'd like to conclude with one thing. Look, it's easy for us, all adults, all who've been through some version of this process, to see the error in her ways in retrospect. But think about it this way. Every time every single person in this room moves up in some way, moves up in some ladder to a new position, to a new role, to a new organization, to a new university, we cease becoming experts in that lower rung in the ladder we were, and we become total rookies in the new one. Um, it's not clear to me that in those circumstances there aren't equally unknown norms, uh, norms that are unwritten rules or norms or expectations that because we've never been there are unknown to us that we, just like Queenie, might have fear we're violating. So I'd like us to think of this not as an instance of a young person who just needs to grow up, but an instance of any kind of person entering a new context in which if you're moving up, guess what? You're starting from, from, from being a rookie once again. Thank you very much.